I'm delighted, first of all, to, uh, to have this interview Thank with you. you. And uh, the Howard School of Communication uh, is very uh, close to me and very dear to me. Yes, I know, and they feel the same about you. Um, so I have a few questions that all I right, prepared sure. that um, I thought you know, would be helpful because as I did some research on you and I found out there's so much information mm -hmm. about you, mm -hmm. it was really hard mm -hmm. to find something that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I wanted to know is, you know, the fact that you've accomplished so much in your lifetime, mm -hmm. what is your favorite per project that you've worked on? There is only one project that I think everything boils down to uh, for me. And that is uh, the reassertion of the agency of African people mm -hmm. transcontinentally and transgenerationally in every form of art, social institutions, ideas, philosophies, and organizations and structures. Uh, I just want to see the reassertion of Africa. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, for 500 years, we have basically uh, lost uh, our path. Mm -hmm. And the regaining of that path in intellectual ideas, uh, in asserting ourselves in the arena of human society uh, as actors rather than as objects or victims, that's what I see. Uh, I've also, of course, been interested, deeply interested, in reframing the way African people are seen or looked at. And so this creation of this program, this PhD program, is, a, is, is an attempt to assert, uh, even within the context of a overall white institution, uh, a liberated space for African people to think freely about anything. But we have become uh, probably uh, in creating the PhD program here in 1987-88 uh, it was one of the major academic achievements uh, I believe in the last hundred years because what it allowed was uh, there was no model for the creation of the PhD in African American studies but creating an African American Studies Department that was based on Afrocentricity in a major university where uh, mainly uh, people who are Afrocentrists, mm -hmm. uh, and we do have a couple of uh, white people who mm -hmm. are, consider themselves Afrocentrists, uh, can give a degree uh, to a person and say you have a PhD. That is revolutionary. This, this brings into mind something that one of our uh, former students, who is a theorist of Afrocentricity, his name is Michael Tillerson, has written. He calls his book uh, Invisible Jim Crow. And in this book, he creates a whole theoretical structure that he calls agency reduction formation. And what agency reduction formation means is that any time a black person attempts to go this way or that way, there's someone blocking or attempting to block. Right. And he calls that agency reduction formation. And most yeah. African Americans have experienced, have experienced that. that. And most Africans on the country. <laughs> Even at your level, you mm -hmm. feel that you're still experiencing that. Mm. Of course. We will experience it until the time comes when uh, we are able, as, as African people, uh, to uh, uh, to stand on our own feet. I think that. Um, Certainly, I assert my agency, but I can all I can guarantee you that the assertion of African agency uh, is always contested. And it's interesting that he was mm -hmm. able to, you know, um, mm -hmm. actually point a phrase mm -hmm. around it, and actually, mm -hmm. and most of us feel that and think it. Yes. But to actually theorize—that's what I teach them. Yeah. I teach my students to theorize because the advantage that Europe has had over. African people mm -hmm. is that Europe categorizes everything, mm -hmm. and it puts you in a puts you in this place. It names everything. Exactly. It you does. know, it, it, they they name you, they create this thing, and they and then they operate as if that's real, and they keep and they get us to operate. As exactly. If that's real. Which is them exerting Absol their agency. Absolutely. <laughs> this is our student. Uh, new, this is our newsletter. 
Jehudi, Jehudi and Seishat. This is the names of the African uh, deities who were responsible for writing. Uh, Jehudi, the male uh, deity, and Seishat. The I never deities. realized that they were yeah. responsible for writing. Yeah. Can we write a copy of that? Uh, you sure can. Oh, you can you. have a copy of this. this <laughs> but this is just a newsletter from our, our department, our graduate students, and, and under, some of our undergraduate students, you see. Oh, but yeah, wonderful. this is. Uh, yeah, we have, uh, and our students here at this department come from all over the world as well. Oh, that is good. We have them from Bangladesh, even, wow. if you can imagine, studying Afrocentricity because they want to know how to examine African data, and, and whether it's in the U.S. or in Colombia or Brazil or Kenya, how to do, do it from a standpoint where they give agency to Africa. Yes. Uh, uh, Africans believe that they brought writing into existence. Okay. They brought into existence the first writing, of course, that we know of is in the Nile Valley. Yes. So, okay. so the, the people just had to have some uh, mythical idea about where it came from, and they say it came from Jehudi and Seishat. Okay. And how do you think writing play a part in the concept of Afrocentricity and reasserting our agency? Well, I, I think that the way that writing plays a role for us is that. Um, uh, first of all, we are the original writers in the world. No, no writing before African writing. Nowhere in the world. And not only are we the people of the who wrote, or I mean, the world who wrote first on the African continent, but we also, I mean, the first uh, major documents, whether they are um, uh, history or uh, Memoirs or uh, literature or religion were written by African people. We were the first people to stand up and call the name God in whatever language. What I mean, what do you say to your critics that do not agree with that concept? <laughs> Number one, it's all science. You know what I'm saying? It's all science. I mean, and it's in the uh, you, one if one studies science, you see it quickly. Um, it's in all, I mean, all modern science, uh, the African origin of humanity. Well, how do you think um, that writing today could, or learning to write our technology is affecting well, writing and, and adolescents and text messages today? Well, I think that writing probably goes hand in hand with some uh, form of um, uh, discursive thinking, you know what I mean? that uh, if you write well and you are able to make arguments and you are able to um, make descriptions uh, and proposals, uh, you can also, by virtue of that, uh, uh, transfer that information or that skill into public speaking. Uh, you become a better orator, more eloquent, the ability to articulate uh, on the basis of uh, things uh, better. So, uh, so, so writing, uh, learning to write is always after the after orality. We speak before we write. But if we uh, learn to write well, it it, it perfects I think. It perfects our way of thinking, our rational development. So, so if we don't write well, and if we write in uh, quips and small uh, notes, uh, that's a whole different thing going on. It's not necessarily discursive, and it's not necessarily uh, something that would indicate that a person is not intelligent. You may be quite intelligent to, to put down uh, GM for good morning. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you have to know something to mm -hmm. do that. But, but I think. Um, uh, but I think writing it out, and uh, writing in a, uh, along the way, might be much more uh, helpful in, in a sense of uh, discursive uh, thinking and writing and, and argumentation and so forth. Uh, so, so I, I don't know. I, I'm not a. I have not got a study on that. But uh, I feel that the the African uh, idea of uh, either whether recording in symbols or on, uh, what we call the writing in the cage or the paintings that go 
going back 40,000 years uh, or more in, in Africa. Uh, all these things were an attempt on the part of humanity to express not only uh, the current situation, but uh, the future situation. So if anybody else came by, you may have some notion of what they had said, what they had done, where they had been, and so forth. So, so that's what writing does. It's a preservation, mm -hmm. in one sense, of, uh, of history and culture. It's also uh, writing uh, is um, a form of communication. Mm -hmm. we, we we're able to communicate with the past and uh, with the future. Mm -hmm. So getting back to some of my questions, one of the things that I want to find out is, um, what led you down this path um, to research Afrocentricity and um, your passion in in the in the diaspora? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was I grew up in Georgia, mm -hmm. and I was one of sixteen children. And I used to work. some of my questions. I used to work in the cotton field. Well, this is what led me to this path. I mean, you work in the cotton field and the sun is hot, mm -hmm. you try to figure out other ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you say, I can do something. Yeah, that, a, uh, I don't like this. You know, mm -hmm. there must be some other way, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to skin this cat. You know, I mean, that's what it's uh, So I think that from a very young age, I had a, I had a, a ethical um, sense that the world is not right the way it was, mm -hmm. that there was no reason for black people to have to suffer so much, mm -hmm. and white people seemed to live very good yeah. on, on our backs, mm -hmm. and we were like, this is not, who did this? <laughs> Where did this stuff come from? This is crazy. Right. <laughs> wow. So, um, so you were encouraged, um, I, I never saw mm -hmm. the name of this mm -hmm. gentleman, you said there was a scholar mm -hmm. that encouraged you to go and study Africa. Uh, Sheikh oh, Hassan Diop. He, he is just one of the influences on me. Uh, the, the earlier influence on me was a man by the name of Frank Thor, my high school teacher. But after Frank Thor, the person who really inspired me was uh, Sheikh Anta Joe. Sheikh Anta, uh, I don't have any. Uh, Sheikh Anta is the greatest African intellectual of the 20th century. One of his books is called For the Camera. Civilization uh -huh. or barbarism. Uh -huh. Sheikh Atajou. Sheikh Atajou, this is, uh, uh, but his, his great book translated into English is The African Origin of Civilization. And The African Origin of Civilization by Sheikh Atajou is a book that put me on the right path. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right, Africa, no, you got it? African Origin of Civilization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by Sheikh out to Job yeah. and Civilization of Barbarism. These are the two major works that made uh, the African scholars in the 1960s declare him the, um, the greatest African intellectual of the 20th century. Which, which actually brings me to one of my next questions. Okay. Like you're, you're actually considered one of the foremost leader and thinker you know, and, and theorists, you know, of our time. Um, how do you see yourself? Is, is that something that you agree with, or do you identify with that, I, you know, with that um, title? To, only, only to the extent that what happens is that I, I probably have just published more than anybody. <laughs> that is probably I don't a, think so, not from this conversation. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I think the, uh, Having published uh, 76, I think 76 now books, that that has helped to increase uh, the way people view me. But I think also um, uh, I have tried to be very uh, progressive and radical in my own mm -hmm. thinking. Uh, I'm a free thinker. I'm, I'm a rationalist. Um, I don't believe in any form of oppression, and I speak plainly on that, whether it's religious oppression or uh, oppression of, uh, you know, gender or anything, I, I'm, I'm a free thinker. And being a free thinker, people could think of you as being somehow uh, uh, more, uh, more intelligent, perhaps, than you <laughs> may be. And I think that my boldness uh, in my thinking 
probably comes from the fact that I was a full professor at third. Uh, if you are in the university, in the academy, if you are a bold thinker, then what happens is that you have many uh, uh, formations, reduction formations, uh, for your promotions mm -hmm. and that kind of, So you have to do and say different things, but since I was 30 years old, I have not had to do or say anything that, uh, except what I want to say. Hmm. If, you, if you knew then, like all the, what yeah. you would have to go through through your journey, right, the right. adversity, the, the criticism, yeah. um, the assertion agent, the reduction formation, the assertion agencies, if you I, knew... I would have, if, if I, I, I'll be honest with you, and I've said this to my son, that, you know, um, if, if I were your age, I would go to Africa, <laughs> basically. <laughs> that my, but that if I knew what I know now, I mean, it, I could have probably, I think Afrocentricity would have, would have blossomed more on the continent than here. Because the, the thing that Africa lacks uh, as a continent is an intellectual idea. You see, it, it, you, you, you cannot, if you look at all the other peace places in the world, whether you look at Russia with Mark, with the whole, uh, they started with the, with now they're capitalists, but you, you, you have to look at the fact that ideas rule the world. Mm -hmm. If you don't have ideas, then you always biting off of somebody else's ideas. Exactly. You, you become imitators of, of, of the French, of the Americans, of the Russians. But, but what are the, what, what ideas have been developed in Africa? for which African people will die. Mm -hmm. what, what is it that we will die for? That we created. But mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the Arabs will die for Islam. Mm -hmm. But what is it that we created that we will die for? So I, I said to myself, we don't have, we don't have, we would die for Arab ideas, we would die for the Jewish, <laughs> ideas, Jewish ideas, we have for you know, everybody's ideas, but not our own. So I, I, to, to me, the, the, the big, gap is that there are not enough people in the, in the African world who see themselves in a Pan-African sense. Mm -hmm. Because if you see yourself in a Pan-African sense, what you discover very early is that our problems are the same, I'm telling you, mm -hmm. with different languages, but we have this, we, we, walk, we, walk, we walk in the same paths. Now, our class is very diverse and multicultural, yes. so could you define Pan-Africanism? Yes, Pan-Africanism is an uh, idea that believes that African people, wherever they are in the world, have a have common interest. Mm -hmm. That we may not necessarily have common specific histories, but our histories are different. I mean, the, 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 you know, the, our heroes uh, may, be, uh, may be different. Uh, our uh, uh, specific uh, uh, cultural forms may be different, but to the large uh, mission of the world, uh, African people have uh, uh, fought uh, uh, fundamentally against oppression uh, everywhere. Uh, we have a commonality of our uh, understanding of, uh, I think, of some basic artistic and cultural forms. I tell people that the music I hear in Nairobi or I hear in Kinshasa uh, is the same music that we can hear uh, on Saturday night over here at the Relish. <laughs> and, and the, the same beats, the rhythms, the uh, music. So there's a com that, that whole commonality I see and I get. I understand that. And, um, but I think that, so Pan-Africanism was a political ideal initially where people believed that Africa should come together, mm -hmm. that all African people, even those in the diaspora, should be honoring and the mother Africa should, should be the key. My view, however, is that uh, I'm Pan-African in that sense, but I don't think Pan-African operates by itself. In order to be truly Pan-African, you have to have a, a, another intellectual idea. You have to have a motor, a generator, and that's where Afrocentricity comes in. Afrocentricity is the generator to produce Pan-Africanism. If you don't have an intellectual idea, you can say you can, you can, uh, Pan-Africanism is just a proclamation. Mm -hmm. So do you see Afrocentricity as a theory, a methodology? It's a, it's a paradigm, which means that there are many theories under it. Okay. Location theory is a theory. Where are you located? Psychologically, culturally. We, we, people have written on this. 
agents of reduction formation as a part of uh, Afrocentricity. Afrocentric, Afrocentric, there, there are many things that, uh, that people talk about under Afrocentricity, mm -hmm. as a, as a, but it's not biological. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in biological determinism. But the, the, the people who are melanists, they normally say things like, well, when you're black skin, because you have the black skin, we have the, 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 the dots uh, in our brain that allows us to be more spiritual. Mm -hmm. well, but at what level do you, does that dot disappear? How, how light skin must you be before you lose your melanin? I mean, what, how dark do you have to be to get the melanin? I, you can't make biological arguments. Mm. You can only make cultural arguments. And culture comes from a, a defined place of what people share and they transmit to each other from time to time and across generations. That's what culture is. So, 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 the, so the fact that Afrocentricity is a paradigm then, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and you can study many things, mm -hmm. um, how do you, if you're in the field of communication, how do students from different fields apply mm -hmm. it, apply mm -hmm. it to different fields, mm -hmm. the, con you know, the paradigm of Afrocentricity? Well, well what, what people do, and people do it a lot, I mean, if you look at the, there's a whole list of dissertations that use the term Afrocentricity. I think there are over a thousand now. So you can see, you know, what how people do it. What people are interested in is they're interested, number one, and when they say they're interested in an Afrocentric perspective on whatever it is, uh, on rhetoric. Like I have this gentleman, this gentleman that is gonna be filming, he, he's writing his dissertation on 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 uh, on Barack Obama's rhetoric. Yes. From an Afrocentric point of view. You see, what he's doing an Afrocentric analysis yeah. of Obama's rhetoric. So you want to know, well, where does Obama show African agency? Mm -hmm. now, how does he assert it? Mm -hmm. This is a fundamental question. You could always ask, how does this, how did this particular text assert African agency? Or is this text actually against African agency? Mm -hmm. This book is called Facing South to Africa because the ancient Egyptians believed uh, th their orientation was not to the north. Right. In the in the U.S., our orientation is to the north, mm -hmm. but their orientation was to the south. Right. You ask mm -hmm. the o o o Egyptians where they come from. They came from the mountain of the moon. This is in the papyrus of Hunefer. We came from the mountain of the moon. Mountains of the moon. That's where they came from. This is so. So I. That's why I thought facing south to mm -hmm. So now, what is this? this essay is actually about intellectual ideas. You know, people used to talk about the East and the West. Yes. And so where's the South? You know, the Eastern world believes this. The West, and they do a lot of that That's in communication. Yes. The East and the West, we talk about the, the, the Asians, or we talk about Europeans. Where's Africa? Yeah. Uh, there's a, a, a movement now among uh, intellectuals in Asia and Africa to try to deconstruct uh, the Eurocentric domination mm -hmm. of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And wh what they're trying to do is ask questions like, uh, when Europe, uh, as long as Europe has been in charge, mm -hmm. so to speak, of writing the history of the world and knowledge about the world, Europe has essentially asserted itself. Mm -hmm. uh, its particular ideology as universal. Mm -hmm. So everybody else is on the periphery, mm -hmm. and, and they say, wait a minute, we're not on the periphery, we're agents, mm -hmm. we're subjects, we're actors, we act, we create, we, we do our own thing. Why do you want to put us on the, on the margins, you mm -hmm. see? So that's how we have come now to begin to understand this, this new world of how we do things. Right. But the last question is, um, one of the theorists we said is Stuart Hall who died earlier this year. Yes, um, Stuart Hall. Yes, 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 um, yes. And, one, and he, he battled a lot with a sense of identity. Yes, he did. You know? he did. Now, now, do you ever, you know, having, having be, become traditional king of yeah. Ghana, yeah. you know, having done all that you've mm -hmm. done, changing your name, mm -hmm. you know, asserting your agency yes, and becoming right. who you are, do you ever find that, that, that struggle, do you ever confront that internal no, no, conflict? Or no, no. No, I think, I, think, I think the Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy had it wrong. I, I, I like them in, in many senses, but I think they had it wrong. What 
uh, and Stuart Hall, I think, was a teacher of Paul Kilgore. He, here's where I think they had it wrong. They had it wrong because they did not realize that culture, fundamentally, uh, the culture that uh, is uh, sustainable in any society is the culture of the uh, ruling class. Now the ruling class essentially sets the tone mm -hmm. of culture. So if I'm engaged as a person who is a member of a group, a group that's not the ruling class, I'm engaged in a culturalist argument, then my argument in order to uh, be sustainable has to support the ruling class argument. So why is Stuart Hall, I think, loved among Eurocentrists? Mm -hmm. He's loved among Eurocentrists because he does not ultimately destroy Eurocentrism. Right. He, it's, an, it, it's, an, it's an embrace, you see, and it's an, ex, it's an extension. It, it is not, um, it's not a radical break with with the liberal or neoliberal tradition of Europe. 